Penny Stamps Speaker Series. I am Diane Beal, art advisor, curator, and artist agent based in Washington, D.C. and Paris, France. I'm here today with visual, performing, and participatory artist Glukia. Originally from St. Petersburg, Russia, now living in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, she is known as one of the pioneers of Russian art, Russian performance art, and is acting under her own name and as a member of the Stodielik group. We appreciate the invitation to be with you today by Stamps and the Center for Russian and East European Studies from the School of Literature, Science, and the Arts, of which I am an alum, proud alumni. And also, I wanted to mention that Crees is actually celebrating their 60th year this year. We were hoping to all celebrate together. Um, but here we are, and Glukia would have been speaking with you today from the stage of the Michigan Theater. However, during these unprecedented times and under the threat of coronavirus, we are with you today on video. Hello, Glukia. Hello. How are things in Amsterdam today? It is like almost everywhere. People are at home in isolation, but there is a, some movement in the streets. And actually, paradoxically, artists are a sort of not enjoying it, but me and my friends we are very thrilled, uh, strangely enough, because it seems like this common sense that is ruling the world in general is now <laughs> became ups and down, and this is exactly the artist's reality. So the artists are a kind of very alive now. And this is a people in the streets and in the shops is uh, things going only with the stripes in the floor, which is about social distancing. Oh, you're so right. So the visual aspect is there as well as the mental. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, let's, um, let's start out today talking a little bit about the themes of your work. I know that you have always worked around social and political issues, mainly about human relations. Can you tell us um, about one of your first performances, Poor Liza, and how that evolved? With my pleasure. Uh, Poor Liza is uh, the favorite uh, beloved performance. It's indeed the first performance. Uh, which happened in 1995 in St. Petersburg. And I did it together with my friend, Olga Igorova, which is Tsapla. Uh, it's dedicated to Poor Eliza, memory to Poor Eliza performance with all my pleasure. It happened in 1995 in St. Petersburg. Uh, and it was dedicated to all who suffered from love. Because for us, the topic of love was very important. It's also important now, but in another scale, from another perspective. We were searching through love and we were also indoctrinated a kind of by romantic idea that we should find the love which is transform our life completely. And we were reading a lot and we were uh, searching and, and falling in love and, and, and so on. And then once when it was, uh, it was conceived actually in Paris, this performance where I was with my boyfriend and uh, it was so much exciting. Uh, every, everything what I was seeing that I just want to jump from bridge like to express it. And my boyfriend said, no, no, no. He was very scared. So I hide this desire. And when I was back in St. Petersburg, um, I proposed it to Sapla. And she was very happy and she said, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so we, which, year, which year was this? Just to get- 1995. 95. It was 1995. And uh, we actually didn't know the word performance. We called it action, we called it jump. 
only later we knew this, this word because we have no education this time. Uh, everything what we, we were doing was intuition. So it was jump, uh, but it was very clear that we have to do it because um, it was a topic of love. It was also the topic of solidarity with people and compassion. And that is the main thing that uh, we were thinking, what is the meaning of art actually? Why we should do it only for ourselves? Or what does it mean abstract art? It, it means nothing for us. We, we want it and we want now also to think about other people, uh, what they're feeling and how we can help them and support them. So that was an idea behind uh, of the performance, but uh, performance itself was, was also very interesting orchestrated because uh, we were doing it almost alone only our two friends uh, helped us. Um, but, and also Timur Novikov, the, the very big artist, a guru of those days, he, he came with a bicycle actually, wow. he passed by. And it was a sign of like, wow, that is, that is really happening. Um, He's no longer with us. Yes. Um, and, we jumped and it was very cold water it was very scary and that's another layer of the work that it's very important to overcome fears yes if you if you are scary it's good you have to go there you have to overcome so we jumped and then this jump was also captured by uh, tv pro uh, tv program cameras so they record this performance and then we became a sort of famous because overnight, overnight. because they include this performance to the uh, everyday tv program wow well i know that cultural events are covered widely in in the russian press so that was that was good that they were able to be there for your performance and did you just it was the jump was that the first did you only do the jump one time or did you repeat the, the jump several times? We never, we, we with Sapla never repeated, although, for example, Charles Escher. Yes. In, in 2002, when he came to St. Petersburg, Charles Escher is a curator and director of Van Abbe Museum in Netherlands now. Van Abbe, yes. He, he liked very much this performance and when he, he invited us to exhibition about uh, collectivism and groups, uh, Baltic Bible. Mm -hmm. But, and he said, you can jump girls in Sweden also. But we were, we said, no, no, we cannot repeat this jump. So we did another work that, that you will see a little bit later. Okay. But, Many years later, when I met my husband, Peter, I, I re-performed re, re this, this piece. Yes, I it remember that. Enactment. It was a reenactment and Sapla was agreed with that. And that was in Amsterdam? Yes, it happened in, in Amsterdam in 2012. Okay, very good. Well, it's a fascinating story and a great way to really begin your career. Um, the education that you received was really a classical education. You went to the Mukina uh, Academy of Art and Design, which I think really prepared you quite well for the artist's life that you have, you have lived um, and created for yourself. Can you tell us, because we're talking today with many students, in, in the art school. Can you tell a little bit about how your education influenced the rest of your work? And what you were working with at the time, were you working with uh, fabric in the beginning? Were you, because we'll get into that later about the clothing. Well, that was, you know, it was very ambivalent, this education. Um, it was dissatisfaction with this education. We don't like this education, nor me, nor Zapla. 
I was studying the Academy of Muhina in St. Petersburg and that was very classical and and yeah, nobody actually liked it because it was, for example, the subject of co communism uh, and it was so incredibly boring and many other things and it was too much te technical stuff and so on, so on. But and that's why uh, 10 years uh, I was never drawing and never doing anything which is related with the school mm. because performances happened, the jumps, the throwing clothes from helicopter, the all kind of experiments, this, this con conceptual uh, clothing uh, stories. But many years after, so after 15 maybe years, I started to draw and because of this very hard training that I got in this school, it means, for example, 60 hours of drawing Apollo or Zeus or Venice head or uh, many hours painting naked body or 100 sketches of parents were posing, you know, near the wall because we have to bring to the school 100 sketches wow so and 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 the teacher can be very angry he can shout he, he didn't beat us but almost you know <laughs> uh so after that uh i started to draw and my my body remembered the hand remembered and i i started to draw but like uh unlearning this uh, as a as a as a child, mm -hmm. as a handicapped, as a, as a like, as a person with whom we are trying to be in solidarity, the weak person. Well, so one of the things that's uh, that you work on that's so impressive are the are your watercolors, which we'll show some examples now, um, and just the sense of color that you use in your works. That's uh, things that come to you from intuition, but I think also from your training. Yes, yes, yes. I'm just trying to tell that my teacher will, will be maybe not satisfied with this kind of drawing, yeah. no? I because because uh, the frame of the school, the context of the school uh, was social realism. Yes, yes. So that was... Well, um, what is the role of clothing in your work? How, how did the clothing come into being and be such an important part of the body of your work? Uh, clothing uh, starts from the isolation. Uh, clothing story starts from feeling of abundance and, and loneliness. It started uh, in... Um, my grandparents' house, Tambovska Oblast is the middle of Russia, mm -hmm. uh, where I was sent it to holidays um, by parents, because in Russia we have these very long uh, three months holidays in summer, and yeah, usually uh, all the kids are, are sent it to, to grandparents. Mm -hmm. And then once upon a time, uh, I opened the, the wardrobe and I saw the grandmother and my aunt dresses. It was silk dresses. It was uh, dresses uh, Second World War time, after that, 40s, 50s. And I suddenly felt something, you know, felt some that I'm alive because there was so great aura around them and you feel the story and, and I started to play with them and I started to experiment and and uh, virtually talk with them and I also did the crazy stuff like for example I took uh, the fewer from grand grandfather uh, yes. coat, winter coat a winter and, yes and I compose it with a very uh, light summer a silk uh, dress of aunt or grand grand grandmother mm -hmm. and you combined it 
Yes, yes. So uh, I, I was speaking, literally speaking with clothes. And then a little bit later in St. Peter's book, I, I wrote the letter to my grandmother clothes, which is in Zimmerli collection, as you know. Yes. And uh, then I also did uh, writing on other clothes and attaching things like hair or strange spots mm -hmm. or something which up the dress is, with the hair which is signifying of this um, complexity of human life and what is usually uh, close hiding from because we have to be adapted to the society and we have to be like like uniform right so society right. inviting us to to dress uh, more or less uh, the same and it means that all the differences and all the all our uniqueness is hidden and my clothes and and Zapple clothes uh was another clothes and you also had the clothing um shop of utopian clothing where people could come in and try on these clothes that you created can you tell us a little bit about that yeah sure so that was first the utopian clothes shop uh and it was in pushkin's curtain mm -hmm. And uh, Pushkinska 10 this time was an amazing place. It was a squat. It was a real squat uh, where all the fantastic, uh, wonderful, crazy poets and artists and musicians, they were all together in, in this squat. And we came there very young little girls. And that, that became our school. That that became our profound education, I would say. Okay. And this uh, shop of traveling things uh, was uh, initiated by Zapla and it was uh, existed in the Cyber Feminine Club, which was curated by uh, Ira Tuganova and Alla Mitrofanova and Ira. She gave a very small room and it was uh, mostly the art community who was coming to this shop mm -hmm. and then later when when Zapla stopped uh, doing clothes uh, Ira invited me again uh, and I, I opened the shop but with different concept because this shop was opened to everybody and it became a more political shop because, for example, um, the girls from periphery, from little towns in Russia can come and, and can get information and sort of education through this uh, clothes and through the working uh, in this shop. And it's important because in Russia we have this problem, I think maybe as in US also, uh, almost as everywhere that we have the capital, Moscow, uh, couple of bigger cities, St. Petersburg, Nizhny Novgorod, mm -hmm. Siberia, Novosibirsk, uh, and then all a huge country, which is absolutely other country. It's a poetry, it's uh, no information about contemporary art. It's no education. It's, it's, it's really like um, a very big gap between capital and, and other countries. So th these girls who were coming to, to this later shop, which called Utopian Clothes Shop, mm -hmm. uh, they they can get uh, information and support. Well, that uh, 
the clothing then became a symbol of, of your work, your early works, and you went immediately then into making films about it as well. We'd like to show a clip from one of your first films, Fragil Triumph of Fragility. This film, this film is uh, uh, made in 2002 and it is only possible to make it this time because if we, if we now will do something like, they, like this, we will go directly to the prison. Yes, yes, things have changed once again. Yeah, and it was a provocation, and it was a, as a, as a very uh, great adventure and challenge to do this work. And it was the first work with, with the people outside the art community. Uh, real sailors from Nahimova Academy, the Na Navy Academy in St. Petersburg, very old, very famous. And they they were brought by uh, Mayor. Mm -hmm. It's uh, of course he he like made the command and and they came and and then we faced the problem that um, they are doing it without understanding what they are doing and that was a real school for us because. When we started to do this film and we saw these faces of these boys who were frustrated and scary and like we saw that they think that maybe we are abusing them, you know? Uh -huh. So we, we stopped the process and we started to talk with them. We were talking with them just what we think. 
you know, mm -hmm. that these white dresses, it's uh, something fragile and we also kind of hesitating to tell what because we don't want to tell that this is a soul because we are not religious people. So, but this is something <laughs> very essential that hardly can be named, hard, hardly can be framed, but maybe it's, it is life itself, maybe it's a poet or artist, these white dresses, yeah. they, they are caring. And then the dialogue starts and then they started to talk to us. And one of the boys said, you know, I don't know if I'm, if I'm uh, in the right spot. I don't know if I want to be here at this academy because in this academy, uh, grandfather is, is, uh, was a sailor in this academy, then father, and then this boy also must go, you know, that the hierarchical structure worked like that. So, and of, only after these talks, we, we can continue uh, the filming. And since that, we are talking with all our participants and always. Yes, which is such a major part of your creative work and so engaging to be able to really talk to the population and get people to open up and express what's really deep inside is, is an incredible part of, your, part of your whole sphere. And I think the way that you've been able to do it through the video, through the film, through the performances, through the clothing, through the talking. You've had so many different ways to be able to tap into that energy. It's really very, very impressive. Do you think it's time to read the manifesto together? Yes. <laughs> okay. The place of the artist is on the side of the weak. Weakness makes a person human. And it is by overcoming weakness, heroes are born. We do not extol weakness, but rather appeal to kind-heartedness and humanity. The time has come to return compassion to art. Compassion is an understanding of the weakness of others and the joint victory over that weakness. You cannot call it sentimentality. It is freedom, standing on the barricade with naked breast, defending the child in each of us. You say that art is only for the very smart, that it's an intellectual game, that there is no place left for true impact, that strong emotions belong exclusively to Hollywood. It's not true, because in that case, art would be meaningless, cold, incapable of extending a helping hand. Art is not an abstract game, but an adventure. Not called rationalism, but life emotion. The artist is not a mentor or tutor, but a friend. Not a genius, but an accomplice. Rather than enacting didactic social projects, we must stop people fearing themselves, help them to accept themselves and grow better. Only by helping people follow the path of self-transformation do we change society. There is no other way. There is no other way. Thank, Thank you for that. It was it's so relevant when you wrote it. And I think still today, extremely relevant. And it's important, I think, for people to realize that art, you know, as you said in the beginning, really comes from intuition, it comes from emotion, it comes from uh, being able to portray or see things that maybe other parts of the population really cannot see. But what you've been able to do is to bridge that gap. I think you, you allow people to tap into some areas that that have been hidden, as you say, even sometimes hiding behind clothing, hiding behind a mask, or hiding behind the job. But you've been able to show people 
another way to, to go inside and to express it and to not, not be fearful. What are the projects that you're working on today that really um, have become important to you? What is the last project that, that you uh, worked on? Um, there is so many things going on that I will focus on the work uh, around the migration topic because I started to, to work with the migrants in St. Petersburg. In St. Petersburg, uh, we have the story that after collapse of Soviet Union, uh, the, the um, like a huge amount of migrants started to came to Russia to, to work on the low paid jobs. The jobs uh, like cleaning toilets, nursing, um, construction site, very uh, sometimes not paid at all. Sometimes people are living uh, in a horrible condition like 12 people in one room without uh, elementary like showers or something. Uh, and it's an equality and um, it's, it was 2012 already topic of inequality was uh, overarching the works. Uh, and I constructed the situation for the encounter of migrants from Uzbekistan mm -hmm. and the dance collective yes. uh, of young dancers. Because I was thinking, is it possible to overcome this inequality and is, is it possible to construct the, the union, uh, Utopian Unemployment Union, uh, like when when people can find each other um, with the help of this uh, project. So the idea of the dancers teaching the migrants some new skills, or what was the what was the initial purpose that you wanted to achieve? What what kind of relationship did you want to see happen? That was a relationship which was uh, hardly also uh, described by words. And that's why you can see now the video fragment. Yes, the video. And especially relevant in today's world with the handshaking 
and how we now have to do the social distancing. Your film is really pertinent to that, addresses all of those issues today. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I was continue to work with the topic of migration um, in uh, Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. now, now we're jumping to this new era, the, the life in Amsterdam. Yes. Because in 2012, I, I, I was immigrated to Amsterdam uh, and I'm considering myself as a trans migrant because it's a, it's a phenomena uh, which is uh, existing in this globalist reality. A lot of artists, maybe it will be changed actually radically now after this corona. I know, I was thinking the same thing. Our lives, uh, the international global experience for the art world. May yeah, change. yeah. But, but before a lot of artists, uh, not only me, were living in two or even more, more countries. One, one of my friends, sharing his life between Berlin and New York, mm -hmm. another between um, it Italy and Russia and so on and so on. Yes. So, uh, but um, since 2012, uh, and then later more and more time I spent in Europe with Netherlands, and I continue to work there because I, with this topic, because I feel myself as a migrant Mm -hmm. And this uh, theme of inequality, uh, I also can can work, continue to work uh, with this in Europe. So one of the uh, project about that happened in Beimer. Beimer. Uh, it's an area in the south of Amsterdam, the area where a lot of uh, people from all kinds of countries uh, live in. And curators who invited me, uh, they they proposed to do to do the work reflected on the on the problems of people, and and their like um, problems and un unsatisfaction of, of of their needs, but actually it was a very wide frame. So because of my my topic always can be described as a conflict, um, observing the con and working with the conflict between inner world of person and, and the society. Um, I decided to, to visit their homes. Ah, uh, yes. So the work that you will see, uh, it's called Multiculti. No, I uh, have here some clothes three parts actually and um, it was one uh, the trousers over here I wear uh, during uh, my pregnancies and it was very uh, beautiful I think and soft three um, so I uh, felt very comfortable in it and um, I had two pregnancies and I used it uh, very much. Now my dream is that everyone in this world will be happy, there's no misery, no wars, no cruelty or poverty and yeah, of course this, all these things are very difficult to realize and uh, when I was a student in uh, sociology and these things were very important for me. I wanted to go to Africa for instance to to work there and with other people. Sometimes 
I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home, my home. A long way from my It, it means the reflection upon multiculturalism because multiculturalism was very important concept uh, uh, about migration there was a lot of hope and this area that the film was made uh, it was the area of this uh, a huge hope of multiculturalism which was not reached because um, multiculturalism believed that the people will come from other all, all countries, Africa, Suriname, Indonesia, China, and then it was a hope that they will dissolve and unite and compose and uh, became a really uh, inserted in, 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 the, in the society, in the local society. But it happened, but not in the way uh, what was expected. Because for example, African communities, uh, Suriname communities, they prefer to marry the women from Africa. Yes. And then it started to be a sort of isolation uh, in this area, like, Everybody knows in Amsterdam that Bijmer is the area of migrants. So that it, it is not like ghetto, of course, but it's a, it's a sort of ghetto with in, invisible wall. It is a wall, but the wall, wall is invisible. So that's why I, I really wanted to visit uh, people's homes because it is a close, uh, mysterious environment. You know, nobody is going. Um, especially in Netherlands, uh, people are very sober, very you know, Protestant background. It's not so easy to overcome the the private uh, frontier and to and cross those boundaries. Yes, yes. And this this project that you did uh, at the prison, the former prison. Uh, where they were holding some of the migrants, you then were invited to do a, an exhibition at the Van Abbe Museum based on your research that you did in the prison. Is that, is that correct? Yes, but that is another project. Uh, uh, the project Multiculti happened in Bijmer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to people's houses, uh, talked with people, asked them three questions, um, but then I also composed them with other people that, that they never <laughs> meet in, in their life organically. So for example, Dutch women mediator uh, is composed in my video with uh, dark skin uh, Suriname mothers who who are doing music in, in their free time and the topic was uh, that society is oppressing our dreams and a lot of people are living and doing not what they like to do and here in this multiculti we can imagine uh, the another world another uh, another script in, and 
it was possibility for my participants to sing the songs or dance what they're not doing in their real lives. Okay. And by Mer Byers, uh, the project uh, Carnival of the Oppressed Feelings uh, is also connected with this area, but it happened a few years later in 2017. And it was a long research, one year research in the formal prison by Mer Byers. Right. Uh, where Dutch government placed refugees. So it was a six towers of this huge formal prison and in one tower uh, uh, refu refugees and in another tower all kind of Dutch people can rent the studios or offices for their work. And because I was searching the ways how can I collaborate with, with the refugees, uh, I decided to rent the studio in this uh, other tower. Ah, okay. we, started, we started to experiment uh, to construct the uh, relationships and I proposed to play the game, language of fragility, about the words which sounds the, sa the same and meaning is completely different. And uh, some of refugees agree to draw it, to, to play this game with me. And then uh, after one year of workshops and uh, performances in this prison, um, it, uh, I decided that have to be generalizing event, uh, big event in the end and it was a carnival of the oppressed feeling. And it was a performance of three hours and even more, I think. And it starts in this prison by Marbais and it finished in the, in the center of Amsterdam, Dam Square. And it was a procession of people, as we will show in these photos, uh, marching through the streets in costume and musical, Musical component, social component, costumes, refugee banners. What else was in the performance? Yes, uh, it was a walk. It was a long walk from, from the prison to center of the city in the costumes. And costumes was important tool in this work because actually, first of all, people are very shy to appear at, at, at the public, right? So mm -hmm. especially Muslim women, they, they never want to, to go and participate, you know, in the public life. And in Europe, this, this carnival tradition is still very strong but it's totally became uh, commercial you know right it's it's totally became also not very interesting because people pe people are just getting drunk and and that's it yeah. and <laughs> i was reading bakhtin and bakhtin is describing the, the russian philosopher bakhtin who wrote a book about medieval car carnival and Medieval Carnival, and it's a fascinating book actually, great, absolutely. And I was uh, amazed that Medieval Carnival was a total uh, event which was transforming everybody. Nobody can escape the carnival. And it was very true that very rich person can become a beggar and a poor person can become king and everybody became equal. So it's about equality and it's about overcoming a status quo. And of course, after that, uh, everything is becoming the same, but I took it as a metaphor of utopian society as like how society can be, how we can be together together with refugees yes together with academics uh together with with the 
elderly people, children, together with any color uh, or, or skins or confessions or, or professions or whatever. So that was a pa parade of inclus inclusive, uh, inclusiveness. Very, very interesting. And I think that leads us almost to the end of our conversation, Glukia, but I would like to mention that I think because of these ideas that you're propagating, you were actually invited by the um, curator and Weezer Okwe, who unfortunately passed away not so long ago, to participate in the Venice Biennale, um, in the main Arsenale, and you did a very, uh, thought-provoking installation for that event as well. And we will show that on the screen now. The installation called uh, The Clothes for Demonstration Against False Election of Vladimir Putin. And it based, and it, it was dedicated to the protests which started in Russia in 2011-2012. And that was a very big thing because before that, since like Yeltsin uh, Putsch, uh, nothing was happened in the political life like that. Because society was destroyed, uh, civil society after Perestroika was destroyed, uh, the elite took the power and uh, it became a, a huge ugly uh, gap between rich and poor and no protests like people were sleeping you know and then suddenly nobody can expect that in 2012 uh, everybody were rushing in St. Petersburg to, to the theater of, of young uh, spectator square like all of a sudden and i was <laughs> even my, my group uh, i'm a member of a group to deal it as we mentioned before and it's a left uh oriented platform of artists philosophers activists writers uh who are trying we are trying to establish critical institution in russia and to resist uh, the putin regime even Stodelet group never expected that protest started. And I was the last person in the group who believed in the, in the, in the street protest. But even me, this day, I cannot sit at home. So I, I put my clothes to the stick and I went out. Uh -huh. And then I explained this to Okri and I showed this clothes on the stick and, and he was like, he selected that because, I don't know, maybe because he thinks that is a true thing and it really was a th true thing. It yeah. was for me as an artist who never believed in this value that art can happen outside in the streets. Is, is maybe this was a, a, a strong vision. <laughs> I believe it is. It is. And thank you so very much for this conversation. It's been so enlightening and so, so interesting. We, we really wish, wish you the best with the continuation of your, your practice. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you also all the best. Thank you. And good luck to everybody during these times. Yes. Stay alive. Yes, stay alive. Please. As, as we're thinking, we, we talked with friends about Corona time and there is opinion, maybe you will like it, that we should become a virus ourselves. Okay. <laughs> and that is a way how we can overcome the virus. We'll work on that for the next talk.